Amen. Well, let me encourage you to stay standing for the reading of God's word as we come to 2 Samuel chapter 12. And uh, this is the word of the Lord for this morning, 2 Samuel chapter 12, the reading of God's word. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there are two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe ewe lamb which he had brought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Well, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, this man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you are that man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You've struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and you shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before Israel and before the sun. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. And then Nathan went to his house. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him up from the ground, but he wouldn't, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day, the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he didn't listen to us. How then can we say to him, his child is dead? He may do himself more harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And he said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he's dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. He then went to his own house. And when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. And then a servant said to him, what is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept for I said, who knows? Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her and she bore a son and called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet. And so he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Now Joab fought against Rabbah of the Ammonites and took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah. Moreover, I have taken the city of waters. Now then gather the rest of the people together in a camp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called by my name. So David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. And he took the crown of their king from his head. The weight of it was a talent of gold and in it was a precious stone and it was placed on David's head. And he brought out the spoil of the city, a very great amount. And he brought out the people who were in it and set them to labor with saws and iron picks and iron axes and made them toil at the brick kilns. 
And thus he did to all the cities of the Ammonites. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. You can be seated. Well, good morning, church. Good to be with you. Second Samuel chapter 12, if you have it, go there. Hello. Yes, hi. Good to see you all. Love the waves over there. What do you guys got? Huh? Oh, hi. Hi. Yes, hi. This is a friendly church, which by the way, welcome. If you're new, we are so glad to have you here. Right, church? Like, we love you. We are delighted that you are here. We know coming to a new church can be awkward and difficult and weird. And so if it's not weird for you, I would love to hang out and talk to you. I'll be outside in the lobby after the services. would love to connect and see where you're coming from and what we can do to serve you. But we are delighted that you're here. We're going to be in the book of 2 Samuel for some time. We're in chapter 12 today, which ends up being a pretty cool chapter, does it not? It is like the one that you wanted to invite your friends to. It's heavy, and yet it's awesome with God's grace just permeating it. It's a sweet, sweet chapter. So let's jump in for the sake of time. By the way, I'll see some folks at prayer night tonight, right? Because we're not just a word church, we're a prayer church, right? This is how we grow in our faith. Five o'clock, great time for you to enter into that. We'll be back in here five o'clock for our prayer service. Okay, title of the message this morning, Amazing Grace. Did you know, did you know, did you know that Amazing Grace, the song, accompanied a sermon about King David from John Newton on 1 Chronicles 17, or the equivalent to us would be 2 Samuel chapter 7 in the Davidic covenant. Did you know that? Now you do. John Newton was inspired to write Amazing Grace to accompany a New Year's sermon on this verse, 1 Chronicles 17, 16, where David says, you remember this? Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far. Do you remember when he said that? We've only been, what, five chapters? I don't do math very well. Seven plus five is 12. Okay. It's only been five chapters, and man, are we a far road away from chapter seven. We are actually, Matt, now, by the time we get to chapter 12, many months after David's commission of adultery with Bathsheba, we are maybe, some commentators think, 12 months or more beyond where 11 ended and 12 picks up. 12 plus months, arguably, of David, King David, who am I, O God, and what is my house that you have done all this for me, aware of God's grace and mercy, who is now living and has for over a year a cover-up of unconfessed sin. And we know it's eating away at him, right? I know some of us, we play the game that we can sin and it's all good and we can just like sear our conscience enough and it won't mess with us. But at the end of the day, we are image bearers of God. We have consciences given to us by God. Sear it all you want, but at the beginning of your rebellion against the Lord or at some point, you can sense what David did. He said this, when I kept silent, like I didn't confess my sin, he says this, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. He carried on like this for a year-ish. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer, he says in Psalm 32. And no wonder. Thomas Brooks, in his book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, says it like this. Every sin strikes at the honor of God the being of God, the glory of God, the heart of Christ, the joy of the spirit, and the peace of a man's conscience. No wonder David was in this place. And a year later, David's sin has left him without hope in it of himself. He has nothing now to lean on. He has nothing left in himself that he can bring to the table. Which leads us to our big idea this morning. That even David, as the covenant king, enters and retains Yahweh's kingdom by grace and grace alone. Even David. 
So the idea behind my big idea is that you write that down, but in your heart, I'm saying even David retains and enters Yahweh's kingdom by grace and grace alone. The implication is then, what does that say of you? If even David, God's covenant king, retains Yahweh's kingdom by grace and grace alone, then for sure we would come to the conclusion that, oh, wait, that's true of me too. There ain't no way you're entering the kingdom of God, and there is no way you're retaining your staying in the kingdom of God apart from grace and grace alone. You have nothing in it of yourself to keep you in the kingdom. It must be grace. And so I want to show you the movements of God's grace that are swirling in this passage, and it is so Good, I pray your heart would exult in the Lord's kindness and his grace. So four movements of God's grace in this passage that we see. Okay, four movements. You're going to see the pursuit of grace. You're going to see the plans of grace. We're going to walk through a theology of grace. And then we're going to talk about what it looks like to be caught up in the grip of grace. When grace gets you and you are gripped by it, your life looks different. You say, I'm gripped by grace, and I'd say, show me. I see it in your life. When you get it, it comes through you in a certain way. We'll talk about each one of those. Check this out. First thing is the pursuit of grace. God help us. We need it. My first point is literally the first half of verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. It's not a big deal. You read that? It's part of the narrative. How many of you have the translation, that first word is, then the Lord sent Nathan to David? Can I get a hand up that you have a translation that says, then? So there's a transition happening between chapters 11 and chapter 12. Chapter 11, who was doing all the acting? David was doing all the acting. Chapter 12, it's God's turn. It's God's turn to enter in. It's God's turn, and it's God's time. Now, I will say, you look at this, and you go, man, that's a long time for God to delay from the action itself to him actually doing something with David. Over 12 months, he let him stay in this state? Like, what's up with God's timing here? And here's the thing. When God delays at his intervening in someone's life in this kind of pursuing way, we can think we got away with something. Listen to me. Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. Your sin will find you out. I don't care if it takes a week and you get it or if it's five years, 10 years, 15 years later. However the Lord decides to go about it, your sin will find you out. God won't be mocked. I like what Chuck Swindoll said about this. He said, you know what God was waiting on? God let the grinding wheels of sin do their full work, and then he stepped in. He's letting sin do its work in David's heart. And at the right time, and I love this, God only ever does the right thing at the right time, right? At the right time, he does the right thing, and he sends, this is our God. If you have a theology where you seek God, and you pursued God, and you found yourself, you do not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are not the seeker, God is the seeker. You are not the pursuer, God is the pursuer. And left to yourself, you would pursue anything other than God. He comes for you. Francis Thompson calls our God the hound of heaven, and it is so true. Your life has the markings of the providential seeing to of God that grace would meet you if you are a Christian. He is the one. And who does God send? He sends this right person, right? He sends a friend to David. He sends a prophet to David. He sends a man respected by David. This is stunning grace. This is what God does. You go, man, God is so kind. He sent a messenger to confront me about my sin. I want you to know something about pursuing grace. I want you to know that pursuing grace is an uncomfortable grace, but just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean it's not grace. See, God's pursuing grace. When you meet God, the problem is you are a sinner and God's pursuing grace. In order for you to know the good news of the gospel, he has to expose the sinner in his sin. And that is an uncomfortable thing for the pridefulness of the human heart. Your heart is so profoundly prideful left to itself that you are entirely offended by the pursuing grace of God. But can I tell you, 
that despite the worldly mentalities that may go on in that moment when you are confronted with your sin, that is God's grace to you. Judgment is God's silence to you in your sin. Judgment is God letting you continue on in your sin. Judgment is you walking out of this room because of your conviction of sin and rejecting the fact that God's grace is pursuing you even in this message. Judgment is letting you remain comfortable in your sin. Grace is God pursuing you to expose the sinner in their sin. Then he continues forward. You see the plans of grace, number two. And I love the plans of grace because we, we can't think of grace as merely a thing. Grace is who God is. Grace doesn't come apart from God himself. Grace has a plan, and it's providential. And some of you may have been able to weave that story together. You think about your life and where you were, and some of you have crazy testimonies about how God met you. And all of those are God seeing too with his amazing providential plans of grace to minister and meet you. Well, we see the plans of grace unfolding in this story. This story is frequently called a parable, correct? But you'll notice that Nathan doesn't mention that it is a parable at all because Nathan is far too strategic to call this a parable. In fact, it may be said that um, as Nathan's telling the story, it seems like David is following it like he needs to make a judgment as the king about something going on in real life. And so he's having this picture laid out before him, right? That there was two men in a city. One was rich and one was poor. One had a ton, the other had one lamb that they raised up. They ate breakfast together, which is weird, but you get the point intimate, you know, they're like, little, here you go, and then, you know, fed his, like, cup to his lamb, and and then back, and so they, my kids would freak out, right, they're in the no double dipping stage right now, like, you double dip a chip, and we're done, all right, (laughs) and apparently there's something, you get it, the lamb is, they're buds, like, super tight, and then a rich man gets a friend to come over, and what does he do, he's got so many lambs he could take from, he takes from where, the poor man, right, And David's so fired up when he hears about it. He's like jumping at the opportunity to pronounce judgment on this. Isn't it interesting our vision for other people's sin is 2020? We're so good at that today. Gosh, it's it's obnoxious, isn't it? How many messages are like, I need to get someone else to listen to this. I hear that constantly. I think God wants you to listen to it. You know, we are so good at identifying other people's sin. David's like, this is jacked, man. (laughs) Little did he realize, and I love this about God's grace, that God had designed a strategy to bring David to his knees. This is what God does. God uses the plans of grace to design divine strategies to bring us to our knees. And he does a couple things that I want you to see it. The first thing is, is he disarms David's defensiveness. We're so proud. We are so proud. You ever been confronted poorly by a Christian? Don't answer the question. Don't answer the question. If you get confronted poorly by a believer, and God bless them, right? I mean, they love you. They're trying, but man, was that aggressive and harsh. And the first thing you're thinking to do is defend yourself, right? So what does Nathan do? He doesn't get in his face. He's a bold prophet, but he's not like, let me tell you, and this, and that. And he goes, hey, so there's these two dudes. One's rich, one's poor, right? And he tells this whole story, which is interesting because he essentially illuminates the problem by highlighting a parallel scenario, a scenario that's not entirely the same but has similar language. Remember, like, um, David took Bathsheba and the rich guy took the sheep. See, because the proud heart is ready to come to the sinner's defense. The proud heart has an inner lawyer that is ready for the confrontation where you to come and just right up, smack upside the face, confront somebody. And so the plans of grace navigate around that issue. I think of the word in Proverbs 25 that a word fitly spoken is a wise reprover to a listening ear. How do you bring the confrontation that needs to happen in the most effective way? Grace finds a way to do it. And it's interesting because we can see the clarity of our own issue when we extrapolate it into another scenario, right? Like I was thinking about the I identify as kind of thing we're in right now. I identify as non-binary, I identify as something whatever. 
they want it to be. And, uh, you know, people in the culture support this and encourage this and all that stuff, but if the person who is supporting and encouraging that is the waiter of a restaurant you're at, and at the end of the meal you identify as having already paid the bill, <laughs> they see the ridiculousness of that, right? That it doesn't actually line up, that you can just identify as something and it's okay. Or if the same person was in a company that you were working in as well, and they wanted everybody to get vaccinated, and you happen to identify as vaccinated, even though you had never, they're like, well, that's ridiculous. And you're like, okay. <laughs> so that's happening right now. Like, it's happening with David, and he's like, there's a problem here. And then what's interesting is not only does he disarm David's defensiveness, but he leads David to judge himself. He doesn't even have to call him on it. David did all the work. This guy deserves it. He has a pronouncement of an oath as the Lord lives. Now, okay, all right, cool. This man should die. That's the punishment he should get. By the way, restitution as well. You ought to restore the lamb fourfold, which by the way is to the exact T of Exodus 22, verse 1. You take lambs, fourfold. You take oxen, fivefold. That's how restitution works. It's Exodus 22. He even goes into the reason behind it. This man had no pity. David is literally walking in. I don't know what you want to say. Walking into handcuffs, walking into the noose. I mean, all Nathan has to say is, you are the man. You see that? One commentator said it like this, Nathan's sword was within an inch of David's conscience before David knew that Nathan had a sword. That's strategy. That's plans. When God wants to get our attention, he finds a way to get around all of our defensiveness. He finds a way to get around that we would try to sidestep the accusation or maybe we would flower it up or we would change it a little bit. Well, only some of that's true because, you know, maybe she wanted me to. Okay. Which, of course, we don't see any evidence of that, but I'm giving a scenario, right? That we have these ways of trying to justify ourselves and by the end, all Nathan had to do was say, in verse 7, you are the man. That was the one convicting statement, and it flattened David. Nathan ends up going on. I want to show you the movement of this because it's interesting, and it helps us understand what I'm going to call our third point, which is the theology of grace. The theology of God's grace that's built into this text. And there's a five-fold movement of the theology of grace that is unfolded here that I want you to just be aware of. And I'm going to give you the points up front, and then we'll talk through it, and you'll get it point by point. But the first thing is, Nathan rehearses God's grace to David. So rehearsal of grace, clarity of conviction, consequences of sin, confession of sin, an assurance of pardon. That is the movement of God's grace. The rehearsal of grace, the clarity of conviction, the consequences of sin, the confession of sin, and the assurance of pardon. Why does he start with the rehearsal of grace? Well, look at verses 7 and 8. He says, you are the man, but then he says, thus says the first thing God wants Nathan to get to him after the convicting statement is, I want you to know how gracious God's been to you. I want you to know that every breath you've taken is a gift of God's grace. Do you know that? I want you to know that every gift you have is a gift of God's grace. I want you to know that every favorable thing that has fallen upon you as a sinner in your life is God's grace. He talks to David specifically. He goes, I anointed you king. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you everything that was his became yours. And he says, if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. See, what Nathan is doing is he's setting up David's sin over and against the backdrop of God's lavish grace. He is not trying to um, coddle David as the sinner. He's not trying to soften the sin. Oh, it's not. Most of the time, we try to downplay the sin. Oh, don't feel so bad about it. God is upplaying it. You have sinned against my grace. 
Don't be the Christian in your small groups that is trying to downplay someone else who's under the weight of sin. Let God's word do its work. Stop feeling uncomfortable and feeling that you need to step into that moment. God wants them to feel that you have sinned against my mercy because when you put sin against the backdrop of the glories of God's faithfulness, it shows the utter heinousness of sin, and that's where good news starts to get really good. He rehearses grace, and then he gets to the clarity of conviction in verse 9, and we're going to break this down. I'll read it, and then we'll break it down. He says, why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You've struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You've taken his wife to be yours, and you've killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. The Hebrew places a special stress on the direct objects in the second part of verse 9. So it reads like this. Uriah the Hittite, you struck down. His wife, you took. Him, you killed. He has a horizontal sin problem committed against others. By the way, clarity of conviction is important, isn't it? When the enemy wants to mess with you and put you into some spin of condemnation, your sin is never clear. What did I do? What do I still need to say? You're in a fight with your wife or your husband or something goes on and you're like, I think we've dealt with it. Why do I feel bad? There's a difference between tossing up the muck of an unsettled situation and the clarity of conviction that is brought about by the Lord himself. Is there any lack of clarity about David's sin here? He knows exactly what he's done, but it's more than that. If you go back to the beginning of the statement, what Nathan is saying by the word of the Lord is to do what is evil is to despise God's word. Think about that. Every moment you choose to sin, in that moment you are are despising God's word. That's hard for us to take in. Every moment you choose to sin, you are despising God's word. And if you are despising God's word, then it seems to make sense that where that despising ultimately rises up to is you despise the giver of the word in that moment. You say, it can't be that intense. Well, look at verse 10 then and tell me that that's not what he says. When he says, now the sword never will depart from your house because you have despised who? Come on. You've despised me, God's saying. You sin in any given moment. It's a despising of the word of the Lord. But just to be clear, it rolls all the way up to our sin in every moment is a despising of the Lord himself. Which when you let clarity of conviction take you all the way to the place it needs to take you when you commit sin, that's how you get to the place that David gets to when he says, against you and you only have I sinned. It's not that he's not aware of the fact that Uriah he killed and, and Bathsheba he took and you know all that stuff that was laid out. It's that it's so clear to me, whatever this was, and it was here, it's so completely consumed with this. This is what the focus is. That's how you get there when you have clarity of conviction that to understand you sin, it's to despise the word of the Lord, which is ultimately despise the Lord himself. And then we get to the consequences of sin. And we see this playing out in verses 10 to 12 and then even a little bit of 14. You can jot that in. Three areas of the consequences of sin, and then I want to talk about it because I don't think we as Christians understand how consequences play in, but he says, the sword shall never depart from your house, right? Which, by the way, is going to be a major theme of 2 Samuel 13 to 2 Samuel 20. We're going to see a whole bunch of the aftershocks of the earthquake of David's sin that will reverberate through the next multiple chapters, and all of that problem is going to be within David's own house. Consequence number one. Consequence number two, you took Uriah's wife, Yahweh's going to take yours. You ever done that, parents? Hey, son, I'm not listening to you until you listen to me. There's a moment for that, isn't there? You've done that, I'm going to do what? Take something from you. Yours was private. I'm going to make yours public. And number three, verse 14, your son's going to die. Okay, a couple things about 
God's grace here. And how does grace and consequence, how do they come together? Well, first thing is grace doesn't remove the consequences of sin, but the condemnation of sin. Grace doesn't remove the consequences of sin, but the condemnation of sin. The law was clear. And I mean the law of the Old Testament. The law of the Old Testament was clear. David deserved death. Here's what grace means for David. Grace means that God, in forgiving David, won't kill David. When you receive grace from God through the person and work of Jesus Christ, grace to you means that God, in forgiving you, won't kill you. Because you deserve to die for the wages of sin is death. Grace also means that God will strengthen you to endure the consequences of your sin. But he will not remove the consequences of your sin, even as much as he'll remove the condemnation of your sin when you trust in Jesus Christ. And one of the things we look at is, if, how do we know? You know you're, you're confessing your sin to a God that is invisible, and you're then moving on with your life, and... I think we kind of look for signs, right? We look for signs like, am I good with the big guy? Like, I, I confessed, and I, I, tr I trusted in Jesus. I mean, I think I did. I mean, I said the words. I mean, my heart was in it. I, I don't, but, but then I, you enter into your life, and now you're feeling the consequences of your sin. You're like, I'm not sure I dialed the right number because he still seems angry at me. Listen, listen, listen. Do not confuse forgiveness with earthly blessing afterwards. If you need clarity about the certainty of your being forgiven, look to an empty tomb where Jesus, after taking the cross, was buried and three days later rose from the dead. That's the confidence you need to have. If you're trusting in the finished work of Jesus, then as sure as Jesus' work is finished, you can have confidence. You don't look to your surroundings after you commit serious sin and assume that, well, I, I think I'm right with God now, and so that must mean it's going to show up in my earthly favor. Listen, the two are not identical. Confession and forgiveness, this is what you need to understand, don't stop the harvest. What do I mean? You sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. The harvest is you sow, and just because you're right with God now, if you confess your sin and trust in Jesus, doesn't mean that the harvest stops. It means that your condemnation for your sin has been taken away because of the work of Jesus. Which, by the way, is a really, really good thing because it helps us understand what we're after in the moment, restored ease or restored fellowship to God. It's a really good gauge because most of the time it's like we say sorry to get ourselves out of the situation. Whatever would just smooth this out and so I can go on and just pretend like nothing happened and, I, and I'll take anything. Okay, for forgiveness from God? Sure. God, would you forgive me for this? If, that, that, if that's going to make my path more comfortable, if it's going to make my path easier, I want to do that. But here's the thing. True God's grace and an understanding of the one who receives it knows that their deepest desire is to be right with God and enjoy restored fellowship, forget restored ease. Lord, if I have you and my way is forward because of decisions I've made, my situation has got exceedingly better because you will be with me in the midst of the consequences. You will strengthen me in the midst of the trials. I get you. Grace allows that to be clear. Another thing I want to say about this too is that too much of God's grace is a response to the back end. We too often as Christians think about grace as, we even have jokes of statements that they're not Christian created, but just the idea of like, um, you can either, what is it, ask for permission or, or forgiveness later, right? And like, so grace for most Christians is like, okay, like, I'll go around my life, I'll try to do the right things, and then every once in a while, if I need to lean in or my passions are there, I mean, I'll just ask, God's gracious. We're, we're missing grace if we understand grace like that. Grace is not there so we can just go about our time doing what we want every once in a while in the flesh, knowing God will forgive you. Grace is actually there to be for us on the preventative side of sin. Grace is there so that by grace, I will now no longer present my members as members of unrighteousness to sin. 
This is what John Newton wrote about in his Amazing Grace. It twas, 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 twas grace. Twas, it was. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. You sing it. To fear what? Ah! To fear God. Grace taught my heart to fear God such that I would be free to obey him, be inclined towards obedience. Grace leads me in that way. It's not just merely my way out when I sin. We need to think of grace preventatively more than we think about it as the way to get out of something on the back end. But consequences remain while condemnation is removed. And then we see the fourth aspect of the theology of grace here in the confession of sin. You know what I love about this? It is so simple. It's like we can way overcomplicate it and God is content with, I have sinned against the Lord. Now we know Psalm 32 was written. We know Psalm 51 was written. We know there are much more elaborate expressions. But here it's summed up in one statement. I think some of us, if we were honest with ourselves, have a hard time letting this be as simple as it is because some of us think, believe, that if we wallow in our sin, if we churn and show God how much it's messing with us, if we just are laden with guilt to what affects us, maybe in even a physiological way, then God will be like, okay, that's the kind of sorrow I'm looking for. And if we're not careful, what that is is your performance meter is playing into some version of you thinking you can participate in your atonement. And you think you're pious and you're robbing the, gra- the glory of God, of, you're robbing God of his glory because you are now infringing upon the work that Jesus Christ's work on the cross was sufficient for. You're going, nah, he's got 90, but watch how much I'm frustrated. That's what we do. And so we can't, we can't even do this without feeling a little bit uncomfortable afterwards. Like, it's so simple. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Who went home justified that day? And we're like, well, he wasn't that mad. I think David was broken to the very core. What I love about the simplicity of this is there's no excuses there. There's no cloaking. There's no blaming. There's no posturing. This is the pathway to repentance. And might I just add this as such an important thought. Many of us, let me put it this way, all of us have sinned with David. The question is, who's going to repent like David? You have all, I have, we have all followed David into sin. The question for your life will be, will you follow David into repentance? That will be the difference that makes all of your eternity one way or another, based on what you do with your repentance. You have followed David into sin. Will you follow him into repentance? What does it look like? Well, I think we see it here. The first thing is an open, unguarded admission of what you have done, right? You are not holding anything back. You are laying down your arms. And you are completely breaking from sin is the second point. There is a change, there is a turning of the whole man, of all that you are, from sin to what? To God. That there is a loathing of sin that rises up within you. The Puritans would say, there's a loathing of sin that rises up, and I know this goes against like modern even Christianity, where it's like, you know, love the Lord, love people, and love yourself. And they would say, actually, when you're getting to repentance, you hate your sin so much, you hate your very self. And then you have a broken and humble spirit. So in the back of your mind, you're not thinking about categories of defense, about why you did what you did. You're not thinking about anger or bitterness you still hold. Honestly, if you want to know why David's a man after God's own heart, and that can remain even in the midst of all this is that, that has gone forward, is because I'm convinced that the person who is receptive to the rebuke of God's word leading to repentance is truly the man after God's own heart. It's not the person that nails it every time because no one nails it every time. Show me the one who repents like this.
Because if you are open and unguarded in your admission and you turn from sin to God, in fact, the only way to go to Jesus from where you are apart from Jesus is just to turn and run to Jesus. And if in that you're like, it is so me, there's no excuse, I have committed this sin and I am seeing now more than ever, it's all against the backdrop of your grace, I have sinned against you and you only, and you run to the Lord, look at maybe the most, one of the most profound statements in all of scripture, here's the assurance of pardon which wraps up this theology, and Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. If the Lord has put away your sin, you are doing far better than you deserve. If everything else is awry in your life except that you have the confidence because of your faith in Jesus that God has put away your sin, you have been dealt with exceedingly graciously. God has been stunningly good to you. And please don't think about this as some sort of an exchange, like a vending machine, where you put in the quarter of your confession and out pops out grace. If you understand grace like that, you don't understand grace because grace cannot be earned. Don't put in your confession and hope to get out grace. God dispenses his grace as he sees fit to do in his sovereign good pleasure and there is nothing we can do to put him in our debt to make him extend grace to us. Which is why it's stunning when it comes to us. In David's situation, David wouldn't die, but somebody would. Verse 14. The child who is born to you shall die. David won't, but a death would occur of a son of David. You hear something? You and I have a similar paradox, don't we? If you are in Christ... You won't die because a son of David has been your substitute and died instead. His name is Jesus. If you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you want to know a way to be reconciled with God, forgiven of all your sins, past, present, even the ones you haven't committed yet, if you want to be assured of eternal life with God rather than an everlasting torment in hell because of your sin against God, and we've talked about this a few weeks ago, but even your little sins, there is no little sin because there's no little God to sin against, correct? He will forgive you and you won't have to die because the son of David, Jesus, has been your substitute. What a word for any sinner conscious of his sins. You have no ground on your own to expect mercy, but thanks be to God that the promises are yes and amen in Jesus if you are in him by faith. You can't even earn your salvation. You have to rest in a trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's where you live. You beat on your breast and say, have mercy on me, a sinner. I believe in the finished work of Christ. He is my perfect righteousness. He is my substitute. He died where I was supposed to die. He rose, conquering all of my enemies so that in him, all of that is true for me. That's where you live. And that is stunning grace. And then David gets it, and you see it starting to play through him. And where does that leave us? It leaves us with the grip of grace. Number four, the grip of grace. We get this whole section, and it focuses on David's behavior. And you have to understand that David's behavior is, like it freaks out all the servants. Right? They're like, uh, he's still on the ground again. Uh, and he's like, no, no, I'm staying here. And they're like trying to pick him up. And they're, I don't even know. Did they bring him like, I don't know, a Lunchable or something? And they're like trying to feed him. And he's like, get, get out. And he looks super depressed. And, and they're, but he's been in there for seven days. 
right? This is what's going on. But we see, what does it look like to be in the grip of grace? Here's the first thing I just want you to note as we look at verses 16 to 20. When you're in the grip of grace, you are seeking the Lord fervently. You are seeking the Lord. It, it, is, it has become a night and day obsession to you. You will not get up off your knees. Now, he has a reason he's not getting up off his knees, right? But look at verses 16 to 20. David sought the Lord on behalf of the child. David fasted and wept all the night. They came. They stood beside him. Like I said, they were trying to lift him up. They find out that the child is dead and they know, but they're like, hey, before we say something about this, I feel like if we say something to him, the dude is going to harm himself. Like he's not in a good place. But what happens when he hears verse 20, what does he do? He picks himself up. He showers himself off. He changes his clothes and he goes to worship, which is another component of what I think you see when someone is gripped by God's grace. It's not just that you are seeking the Lord fervently, it's that you have a settled response to his sovereignty. You have a settled response to his sovereignty. What is David's response to God's sovereign decision in this moment? He worships and he returns to his life serving the Lord. He worships and he returns. He gets the news that his son is dead. He spent seven days pleading with God that he might preserve his son. Here's what I want you to see as we're looking at this. Yahweh didn't grant David's plea. True. But let's not judge David for his pleas because David's seeing something about God that we often miss about God. In other words, what I'm arguing for is David was right in his thinking about God even though God didn't answer his prayer. And what does he write about? Look at verse 22. He knows something about God. He hasn't separated grace out as a thing. And God over here, something God dispenses, he goes, who knows whether he'd be pleased to be gracious. David's seeing something here. He's like, why not? Why not, my son? Why not? Why not even pro provide him back and do it by grace? I know I don't deserve it, but when have I ever in those moments deserved it when he's poured out grace towards me in my sin, in spite of my sin? Grace is never meant to be based on something we do. It's entirely unearned. It's entirely undeserved. It's not built on anyone's merit. And so David's like, this is who God is. God's in the business of giving out Grace. I don't know, believe it. As long as my son is alive, I'm going to believe it with every last ounce in me that God may choose to be gracious in this moment. Because he's looking at it and going, what makes this moment any different than any other time God has shown grace? This is how it always goes. And you know you're gripped by grace. When he passes... And we can make too much of that. I don't have time. But when he passes, he picks himself up and he presses on. Once more walking with the Lord as he did in the past. He goes back and he comforts his wife who's mourning. You don't see any bitterness. You don't see any blaming of God. You don't see what's very common in our day, drifting from God because of a circumstance like this. You know what you don't see and I hear a lot? You don't hear anything like, but God, I have literally been following you so well for so much of my life. This seems a little excessive. You get none of that from David. And I would agree. He's probably kicked butt on the following God thing a lot better than most of us. And we would start just complaining about it. He is rightly sizing God and his character. Rather, he says, God has done it, and I will accept it, and a heart gripped by grace makes no demands on grace, because grace is not something to be demanded, it's something freely given by God according to his sovereign good pleasure. And maybe that's just the last thing I'll throw in, is that you're gripped by grace when you understand the severity of discipline and you see it correctly. Any discipline that comes to your life that is chastisement and not execution is God's grace to you. Any affliction that you're walking in, in accordance with Hebrews 12, 7, it is for discipline you have to endure. Listen, God is treating you as sons. 
To be in a place of affliction is to be one of the greatest places because it is absolute dependence on the Lord. You are trusting him. You are in the clearest way for your soul, seeing rightly the ugly face of sin. Affliction, in this sense, keeps us from sin. It restores decayed graces. It does so many things in our life. And then his life just moves on. Joab's about finished capturing the Ammonites. The standard for the king is to strike the finishing blow, so he invites David in to do it, subdues the Ammonites, puts the crown on his head. Seems like a very anticlimactic chapter ending. Like we're deep in it, and now we're to the war again, but maybe that's the point here. Maybe the point is is that the battle with Ammon was won, but the real battle was lost. So as to remind all of us that even David, as covenant king, enters and retains God's kingdom by grace and grace alone. So we're going to be reminded of that as we come to the table this morning. And we are going to come as individuals, and what's going to happen is I'm going to step down after explaining, and you're going to come up, and you're going to grab the elements, which are double cupped. You have a piece of bread in one of the cups and some juice in the cup on top, and you're going to pull them out together. And this is a meal that is a communion meal where we enjoy the spiritual presence of Christ and fellowship with one another, knowing that we are forgiven of our sins, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. His body represented in the cracker, broken for you, his blood shed for you. So if you are a believer, this is a meal for you to provide assurance of the pardon that is yours, not by the taking of it, but rather by the faith you have in what this represents. And so you come as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who this meal is for. And it is to remind us that we as well, just like David, stand in confidence before the Lord's presence by grace and grace alone because of what Jesus Christ has done. So I am going to step down, and when you're ready, you come. Not only will you take, but you will take it. You can take it as a family. You can take it, but you will be taking it on your own today as we continue to worship. So let me invite you to do that.